I had a really pivotal moment as a trainer. If you, as you remember Nash, I'm working with a client named Nash and Nash has got a lot of problems, a lot of triggers and we're working through it. And Nash's owner is doing a phenomenal job. And I had a really good session with Nash. And when you're, I'm actually going to stop the screen share and say this, when you're good in a session, that means that you were able to explain things in a way that the owner understands. You were able to make them feel like they can take steps forward and they've got this and you were to motivate them to start moving the process forward. And oftentimes that leads to phenomenal success. That's why when you see someone one week down the road and then you see them again and all of a sudden you see dramatic improvement in the dog, it's not the hallmark of what you did a week ago or two weeks ago. It's a hallmark of them being able to take the baton and run with it. And the couple days after I did my first session with Nash, she sent me a video of her working Nash and she lives in quite a busy area, like an RV park next to a pretty high traffic um, road. And so there's dogs and the dog is ramping in, in the house and ramping on the lead and ramping and it chases cars. And so I had this really good session. We were able to identify the triggers. Nash's mom is super motivated. And then I was sitting on the couch. I'll never forget it. And she sent me a video of, she was sending me a video of what Nash's car reactivity looked like because we hadn't seen it, but she was also attempting to work it. And it scared the shit out of me because Nash was super dynamic and flipping around and I saw her being jerked and she was so close to losing the lead and he could have been potentially hit by a car. And I had a moment where I started to realize that a motivated trainer that takes everything I say and plays the part of the best dog trainer they can be and move forward. If I were to be aces in my session and they were to go, got it, get it, let's go. I could inadvertently put the dog in jeopardy because we live in a very densely populated area. All of my owners come from San Francisco and Oakland and just where you're amongst a lot of triggers and it's really hard to avoid it. You can't just throw your dog in a car because if you were to go to a beautiful scenic area, a field, yeah, everybody in the Bay Area is in that field. If you were to go on some scenic hike, yeah, everybody on the in the Bay Area is on that hike. Like it's a very outdoorsy place to live. It's California is one of the more beautiful places to live in the world. So everybody's always outdoors. And so you cannot get away from it. There is no... And it's very hard to find the right setup to work distance. And so because of that, I immediately looked at my discretion around collars as far as what the dog should be on. If I felt like there was a, a size disparity uh, or if I felt like the dog was super dynamic and just leaped before they look and posed potential risk in dragging the owner down, dislocating a shoulder or at worst the dog uh, losing uh, the owner's grip and running and getting hit. Thankfully, that's never happened, but that video was a huge moment for me where I realized that like it could happen. It could happen in that video. So I started to immediately start recalibrating. As luck would have it, that next Saturday, I had an owner come in and just start crying. She's a, a volunteer at the Oakland shelter, and she's foster failing with one of these dogs. And it's special because she's worked a lot of dogs, and this dog, out of all the dogs of years and years and years of volunteering and fostering, spoke to her. However, this dog is a very powerful bull breed adolescent and super strong, super dynamic, and pulls like nobody's business, conditioned to pull. And we've been working and I author, I put her on, I put the dog on a two inch martingale and she came back to me in tears. She lives in Oakland and surprised the dog gets overstimulated as soon as she steps out her front door. And I had to up the leverage and I had to up the safety. And so for the first time ever out of uh, 5,000 plus dogs, uh, you saw me in session conditioning a prong. And I felt very insecure about it um, because it's easy to say I don't use tools. It's not a, fl a flag that I fly. It's just that I do not see them in my program. I don't administer leash corrections. So they're in, I'm not popping a flat collar. I'm not popping a slip. I'm not propping prongs. I don't use pressure as a means of communicating to the dog. So that's why it's not in my program. However, I've always said, use the collar that makes you feel comfortable, that keeps everybody safe, that keeps you out of court. But they're in because now I've said, like a prong might be the right collar for you to keep everybody safe. I now have to do good prong work. I now have to help the dog 
be conditioned appropriately to the prong to listen to it so that it doesn't habituate and it become neck hard and start pulling past it or it flatten the dog out and the dog not want to move and you create robo dog right these dogs just not really wanting to move because they're scared of the pressure on the prong so they're in because i'm saying this collar is something that will probably help you we've got to use it correctly so that it does its job and so i'm using tools and so far it's been very unsettling for me because i fear backlash I fear rescues not wanting to partner with me. I fear losing sponsorships. I fear all of the stuff that happens when somebody sees you on video with a prong. But I have to do what's in the best interest of my clients. No, I'm not going to level a dog with a prong. No, I'm not going to use pressure as a means of teaching the dog to chill out. I will prescribe a prong when I feel like the two inch martingale is not enough leverage. The dog is ultra dynamic and they're gonna get in trouble, somebody's gonna get hurt. And this session, you're gonna see me in the middle of the session talk about prong, and I actually go through explaining the science around the prong and what it does, what is good effective handling with it, what is it meant to do, and then what's aversive, and how do you avoid the dog considering the prong to be aversive or the dog correcting itself with the prong. It's not just about your handling and what the dog interprets with the communication coming from it. It's also about them being not understanding they're on this new thing that's going to dull out all the pressure in the world and ramping against the end of the lead, pow, correcting the shit out of themselves, right? You really got to make sure that all the signals being in, sent into the brain are constructive and intentional, right? And so to do that, you got to teach the dog to listen to the prong. And so to do that, you got to train pressure on pressure off so the dog understands it and starts listening to it. Uh, you won't see prong being a consistent uh, tool that I, I go reach for. But after that big wake up call video with Nash's owner, I started to realize that I am, I'm putting dogs in danger, some dogs uh, in danger, considering the ones that are really dynamic and really giving it their all. And it's the worst case scenario that can happen in a tumultuous area like the, the Bay Area. So I know yeah. backlash is just part of the game but anyone who watched that session and i did could see should be able to see the way you went about it and how well you, you were conditioning the dog to it i the trainer i originally saw was zoe put her on a prong did not condition the prong did not do any of the things that you talk about any of the things i watched you do and she hated it and she became so neck hard to it so it didn't matter like she she's a pity so that happens anyway they can be neck hard but there was no she didn't care about that prong she would pull right through it and now i have her on a two inch martingale and she's so much better mm -hmm. but she was never conditioned to the prong and it was it didn't turn out well but anyone can see that you were you didn't just slap the prong on and start applying pressure and <clears throat> Yeah, it's you, you have to, in order for you to do good work, you have to, like, I've got to, I can't just put a prong on. I have to immediately do good prong work. I have to immediately uh, acclimate the dog well to it and have the dog listening to it appropriately. And so it's a funny thing where I'm not, I'm, as my program is starting to create, I'm creating more experience. I'm taking on more dogs, different scenarios. And now I'm like, I need this for this particular dog. I immediately, as soon as I incorporate it, go, I have to do good work with this and I have to make sure the dog interprets it appropriately. And so not only am I jumping onto the balance bandwagon where everybody's going to see that video and really uh, the right, the, the certain amount of people are going to light torches. Um, but I have to make sure that I'm doing a good job of explaining the fallout, doing a good job of explaining what it looks like when a dog deems it aversive. You're going to see in this video subtle moments where the dog is shaking off the prong in that moment. When I put it on Zoe, Zoe's the adolescent pity, right? Immediately when the prong went on, Zoe went to scrub it off on the cot immediately get this thing off when you see those things like you're up against a rock in a hard place to make sure that you bring stimulation in they get used to it they understand it they're not scared of it they're not bothered by it and they listen to it right and if you don't do it correctly then more or less you're working it sloppy balance work is compulsion 
That's what it is. I don't care about the dog's sensitivities. I don't care about doing it the correct way. I don't care about implementing it correctly. It's going to do its job. The dog is going to listen to it. And therein, you're going to get dogs that are unbothered by it and listen to it. And then you're going to get dogs that it's going to completely dismantle. And then you're going to get dogs that are going to feel it and go, fuck it. And just start pushing harder and getting that card. And now they're pulling themselves and they're damaging their trachea and all that crazy stuff, right? As with anything, you have to make sure that you're being super mindful and super methodical and preparing the owners with the right education to do it correctly, right? But like I said, uh, we'll see what happens. I don't think I'm going to lose my Zwi sponsorship. The, the Zwi just partnered with Robert Cabral. Thankfully, I don't think they're going to turn their nose up to it. But there's always going to be a side effect. In that session, I had to say to the rescue, if you're going to prescribe a gentle eater and you're going to tell people not to use prongs, you don't understand aversion either. Right, <laughs> like, like comparatively speaking, I not for nothing, and this will be a nice little clip for social media. But gentle leaders are aversive. Gentle leaders are a compulsion tool. It's not a force-free tool. It's a compulsion tool. The dog goes with the gentle leader because it's unnatural and it has no leverage, and it is compulsion work. There is no way around it. And so this idea that the prong is uh, evil and that a gentle eater is force-free, it just shows you the knowledge gap with how these things work and then how foreseeably dogs can interpret them. But most importantly, the work that goes into making the dog feel okay about it. For a force-free trainer out there that might hear those words in my, out of my mouth say, I condition gentle eaters to be perfectly fine and perfectly natural with the dogs, Guess what good balance training says about the prong and the e-collar? I condition it so that the dog thrives in it and understands it and listens to it. So you're both doing the same thing. You've just drawn your lines in the sand on what you deem ethical. But the common ground there is how is the dog interpreting it and then how can I make it hunky-dory and get the job done and get the dog totally copacetic with the item that I put on them. <clears throat> Oh, it's another example of the transparency that we love about you because you could have, when that went that started going that route and you knew that's where you're going in the session, you could have cut the session. Yeah. We would just assume your phone died, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you could have yeah. cut it. Nobody would have been any wiser about it. So yeah, I've lost, I've the voice in the back of my head. There used to be a voice in my head. It was two people talking. It was, I'm doing this. The dog is doing this. And then there was this other voice that was like, this is what they're interpreting. <laughs> and that was like two years ago, two and a half years ago. I've been live for so fucking long. That voice has gotten way dimmer and people aren't really coming after me. My mods aren't telling me that people are jumping in and talking shit about my work, probably because my work has gotten better over the years. <laughs> so yeah. the bottom line is that this is my journey. This is where I'm at. And I'm open to evolution and evolution is not linear. It's not just a building block and higher and higher. Sometimes it's a wreck and redo and sometimes it's a pivot, right? That's what the journey is. All right. So you guys saw the clip that is now viral. I did not think it was going to go viral, but it did go viral. This part. Wow. Here. All right. First order of business. Yeah. Okay. Seats. Hi. Hello. Flats. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, she just responded to a German command, so we got to look at this. Oh. <clears throat> We've been using the. Um... Please say you've been using German. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> We've been using gentle leader. Seats. Flats. Off. Hui. Nine. Ha. Fuss. Six. So, so I'm throwing in all the other German commands. Yeah. Fui. Nine is punitive. Typically, if you see the ears go back, they know they're in trouble. Revere is to bark. Revere. She is Revere. turning around and ramping towards me when I say Loose. it, so it might have been used. Loose right, we'll is Dutch for turning loose. When you, if the dog is trained in Dutch, and they say loose, they'll go for something, they'll target a tug, they'll hit a sleeve, etc. Uh, there's another attack word out there that is puck puck that a lot of people use. 
so far the dog was trained in German, relatively young dog. You might have more concern if this dog were older because there's probably more work behind it and the behaviors are more ingrained, but the dog is like a year and a half at the most, maybe two years. So whatever the training was is probably formative and that's no big deal. The other thing is bringing out toys. So that jute wedge, if you bring that out, it looks a lot like a sleeve. If I were to bring out a big tug or that jute wedge and the dog were to arr, 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 immediately and they're ramping against the lead as I've asked the owner to hold the dog, uh, then I know the dog has had extensive bite work and the dog is ready to go, ready to work. She's acting like a springy puppy and is super overstimulated. And that coupled with she sat pretty for me automatically. They didn't teach her that. So that tells you trick training versus bite work. <laughs> I don't think there's a PSA trainer out there that's taught their dog to sit pretty. <laughs> so I think we're okay. This is a shelter dog though, right? Make an appearance, but uh, this is a shelter dog though, right? It is. How old? A year and a half. Wow. Yeah, year and a half. Picked up by Milo. Flirt pole, we know she likes to chase squirrels, real serious about squirrels, so we know this is gonna be a thing for her. When I go to do this, I'm ramping the dog purposely and then I'm checking for breaks. So the dog was able to sit for me, which is great. Also, it's overstimulated. If you look at the modal patterns, the body language, it's overstimulated, it's leaping completely different than the squirrel. When you saw her lock onto a squirrel, she was very dedicated, very tense, and just wanted to get to the squirrel. There was no overstimulation. The predatory mechanism is not really as intense with the mimicry that I'm doing with the flirt pole as it is the real thing. She's immediately dispatching my flirt pole, ripping the fur apart. Might have lived off of cats and squirrels, most likely. I, obviously, we don't know the dog's backstory, but really emaciated, very skinny, tapeworms, kennel cough, all that shit, but was astray for a hot minute. And so I would imagine that this dog was trying to catch meals and was going for squirrels. Jumped off of the foster's second story to go for a squirrel, jumped over the balcony and landed and went for a squirrel. So that's pretty insane prey drive. Is this anywhere near Tri-City Shelter or whatever? The That's where Keeley came from. Keeley's exactly the same age, has a lot of the same characteristics as this one, and is in the same area. If you go to the YouTube, it's posted. In the beginning, they tell me, as soon as she walks in the door, I say, where'd you get her? I think they mentioned where she was picked up. Okay. Yeah. So I'm trying to cap into a sit. So if you look at this, it looks really sloppy on YouTube. The trainer's probably laughing at me. But again, I work on communication and I'm totally okay with a dog not doing something the first time. I'm not going to come reach down and pop the leash to get something done immediately. So therein, I communicate, I am finesse, I experiment with how can I communicate with you. And I don't care if you jump up, I'll eventually get there. You'll eventually go into the positions that I want you to go into. You'll eventually release for those toys, no problem with perfect precision. So this is just a means to an end for me. Now, all I can get at this point is a sit. I got some downs. I'm able to get see that jumping up. So she's a leaping lizard. When a dog is performing a nuisance behavior, whether it's overstimulated, doesn't necessarily matter. And they're presenting that behavior in whatever I've, I'm trying to accomplish. I will just communicate. So when you hear that dog jumping off the ground and you hear me going, ah, you hear that red light communication. Every single time the dog jumps up, the dog's, oh, you don't want that. Oh, you don't want that. And then I'm leveraging the resource and the dog starts to understand, oh, the shit, I'm not getting the flirt pole if I jump up and he doesn't want me to jump up. And then as soon as that dog caps into a sit, I release it. You do that sequence enough, the dog stops jumping, moves sooner into the sit so they can get to the flirt pole sooner. So this is all, I would tell you that if 10 trainers are watching this, a lot of the trainers that might affect physical corrections as a means of getting things done, especially with a dog like this, just meeting this dog, when they watch me do this stuff, they think I'm an absolute joke because in their eyes, the dog needs to do it. The dog needs to respond and punishment is a means of getting a dog to listen. 
Uh, and so for me, I'm totally comfortable with communicating there often and getting 30 repetitions of don't jump and just communicating verbally and pulling that flirt pole out of their way to show them they're not going to get it. And then surprise, surprise, I accomplished the same thing, except I established a bond. I didn't flatten that dog out. That dog didn't lose any motivation because if I'm looking to perform drive capping and calming, a correction will kill drive and it will kill my handshake that I've got going on. I want the dog to love me. I want the dog to be motivated by me. And I just want to communicate, don't do these things. Almost like a red light, green light. That's all I want. And I'll communicate all the day as long. Now, there are those dogs, if you've ever seen me in session where I'm not able to accomplish it, there is a true threshold sensitivity and the dog is just like fucking going nuts. You'll see me switch it up because it's too much for the dog and I'm not able to accomplish the reps. But for this dog, you start to see it smooth out. You start to see me accomplish the reps. The big unlock for this dog is I pull the flirt pole behind my back and I use hand signals and the dog is watching me. So the dog's a little bit more visually adept. And so those hand signals get my nice cap and my nice compositions beautifully. And so just a little bit of experimentation helped me to understand the dog a little better, lower the criteria, and then let's get back at it. <laughs> Got the down. The sounds that I'm making can be stimulating and can be like it's a gas and it's a break. So when you see me go ah, 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 as the dog narrowly misses, my auditory stimulation is stacking with the dog narrowly missing and stimulating that dog and potentially increasing more drive. So when you hear me vocal on the flirt pole, watch how I succinctly put those sounds with the movement and with the misses to induce more drive. You see how I'm tapping her on the butt? We are, I'm a trying to get these repetitions and I'm trying to get consecutive repetitions. So the funny thing that's happening is I am purposely stimulating this dog. And every single time, look at that. Look at that nice little shot right there. Every single time that the dog disengages from me, looks at its own, fuck this, I don't get the floor pole. And I immediately see that the dog's disengaging. I tap the dog on the butt with the floor pole and I get them to re-engage to refeed into the sequence. And I do that because I don't want to lose momentum. Like bad, good decisions and bad decisions, I can give a fuck. As long as they're consecutive and I've got a nice little pace going, I'm going to get across the finish line. What will kill my clarity is the dog disengages because it didn't get the flirt pole, it doesn't understand, and it runs over to mom and resets, and I lose that engagement, and I lose that momentum, and now I can, potentially I might have to start over. So you're going to watch me routinely touch this dog on its ass to get it to refeed onto me. Six. That. Six. that Seats. pull it away look for that sit look Seats. for look for going back to squirrel hunting Seats. sit working on tones it's my tone look at that Seats. threw it at its butt Seats. Ah. Seats. let's go Seats. threw it at its butt Seats. Ah. Ah. Seats. Pull it from my back. Use my hand. Bam. Very good. Get it. See that? Slow down. Use my hand. Easy peasy. Seats. Place. Place. There you go. There you go. Bonding good with job. the dog. Good job. Good job. Pulling the. Yeah. Touching the dog. Remember, I'm not trying to accomplish anything here. I'm just trying to see how oversimulated do you get? Are you able to listen to me? And so sometimes the criteria is purposely high because I want to see how much you're struggling. And if I can get you to cap and you're super excited and you're going to that flirt pole as fast as possible, then I, from an assessment perspective, can tell the owners, I think we're okay here versus, oh shit, no, like this dog cannot hear me. There's auditory exclusion. There's possession issues. The dog won't out the toy. We got head bumps here. We got problems here. Problems that, you know, are going to take more time, more session, right? So this is more or less for an assessment purpose. She loves it. I guess my uh, film was glitching. So. The one? 
saw is repeating itself a lot on YouTube. <clears throat> so got the assessment done on Fleur Pole. I feel comfortable. She's a springy, she's a spring chicken, right? She's super affectionate. Yes, yeah, she's overstimulated, but uh, it's such an easy starting point if I can cap her into sits and downs and she's totally motivated to continue to work. So I'm petting the dog, getting some love in the whole time, building a bond. And then a squirrel comes out and I experiment with how to work through the predatory drift. Remember this dog did jump from a fucking roof to go after a squirrel. So I know it's going to be extreme, but again, I'm going to look to see, can I communicate and get this dog to come back? There it is. Oh, it's just an anticipatory posture to get ready to go after the squirrel. Yeah. Backyard mouth. There's Your back legs are shaking. So that, you can see that manifest with toys sometimes. The mimicry, it actually does activate the predatory mechanisms in the brain and the dog goes for that fucking thing like it is a squirrel. When you see me work bull breeds and they go after the toy the way this mouth is going after a squirrel, you see me stop immediately because if those areas of the brain are activated, it's a big stressor and a big concern as to whether or not the dog can hear me and whether or not I now become an obstacle to get to that toy and now I get attacked. And that has happened a couple times in a session. Oh, new one. Cyrus has got a girlfriend. So tail is shaking. Back legs are shaking. Yeah. There's the bark. I pitch bark. <sighs> Auditory <laughs> jiggling. Yes, that's a good girl. Lure blocking. Can't lure sit. Go. Come. Come. Changing trajectory. Come. Come. Being a nuisance. So she caught a little bit of adrenaline. See how stiff she is. Communicating red light, the same. You got her on a martingale now. But the same that I used in my flirt pole work when she jumped up now can be a red light communication in a scenario. It's something you can use for virtually anything where you go, hey, what you're doing isn't currently leading to the reward. But this dog is dead set on this squirrel. And she was, she might have already felt a prong. Grab that prong right there. I forget how we got on the subject. If she is. You got her on a martingale now, so I'd probably just go wide. We got one of those, um, they really got one of those, like, plastic. Oh, okay, yeah, so she talks about she's got a, she's got a star mark because they couldn't control her. A star mark is like a plastic prong, and so she's saying we, we secretly put the dog on a star mark because we couldn't control the dog and we're really scared. And I was telling him that most likely this dog has been on a prong before because it's a Malinois. And so we put the dog on the prong to see. It's an interesting test. Getting different advice. Like I had on a harness, which was not good. Let's go. Yeah, she's yeah. already been pressure trained. Let's go. <clears throat> see that? Yeah, she's moving to the vibrations she is turning like power steering like butter i had her on a that blunt martingale it's probably a half inch martingale no problems pulling against it not listening but completely turns watch my hand see watch my hand for a second so let me pause it let's just see how so watch my fingers here this is my fingers Watch how they move. I'm moving my fingers alone, not even my wrist. That's the subtlety in communication that's coming from me right here. See that? <clears throat> you see how she's moving to the vibrations of it now where I couldn't really get her to pay attention to me because she was looking for the squirrel. Now she sees a squirrel. No See, problems. So yeah, she's been on a prong. Okay. <laughs> Somebody put some training into her. She's cats and squirrels were. So now we're gonna, I'm prescribing that this prong probably stay on. And to do, I now want the owners to feel what the prong feels like. For a second. Which were, which? 
So I'm going to put the prong so on hyper the, the dad's wrist and I want him to feel it. And I want him to understand the difference between tactile stimulation or what, me, what might be referred to as haptic feedback going into the brain to say, I feel touch versus nociception. So the nociceptors and the meconoreceptors saying, I feel pain, I feel discomfort, I feel threat. Yeah. So let's just say this is a tight prong. Yeah. This is about what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be snug because if it's loose, it falls down to the thicker part of the neck. Yeah, and that can already be painful. Okay. If you feel the way this thing is supposed to work, yeah. it's evenly dispersed pressure. For this jiggling that I'm doing, yeah. there's sensors under your skin that are saying, I'm being touched, right? Yeah. It's almost like jolting in your brain right now, right? Yeah, yeah, so it can be a very a power steering. Come, yeah. go, sit down, yeah, yeah. go, down. Now she hits the end of it, Yeah. not good. Different receptors under the skin right now. Yeah. McConnell receptors, nociceptors, they're in charge of sending pain and threat signals into the brain. Mm -hmm. That's going into your brain right now, so it sends yeah. a different message. Okay. So your effective handling has got to be on point yeah, okay. because it is a power steering, so that thank the person that already conditioned it for her to listen to. Yeah. But in that, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. You want to get good at the smallest amount of vibration and that's all it is. Prongs are brakes. For her, it's power steering. Let's go. See? Yes, very good, very good. So as she's shaking it off, it might be a sign that she doesn't like the prong, something yes, to pay close attention to. Very good, very good, very good. Or my app maybe hasn't worn it for a long time. Very good. You're so what am I doing? I'm pouring on the stimulation. I'm making it fun. I'm making her enjoying the experience that she's going through right now. If in fact she is somewhat uncomfortable by the prong. You're so good. You're so good. Let's see if she knows a heel. Boots. Yeah. Circle around heel. Right side heel. Boots. Boots. Yeah. yeah. Pressure guided heel. So she knows heel in German. <clears throat> Big concern in this. So I actually, when you saw me off camera, I actually showed the owner on his wrist what it felt like when it was good handling and what it felt like when it was a correction. So I actually doled out a minor correction on his wrist and I wanted him to feel it. Like I, and I would probably do that for every owner that is going to go on, put their dog on a prong. I want them to understand what it feels like when it's copacetic and when it's just communicating versus aversive. I want them to understand the dog's experience there. All right, dog test time. Doesn't see her. <clears throat> so majestic in that light, huh? Yeah. A little suspicious. Tails wagging, loose body language. Yeah. By the way, just so you know where I stand in my process, I took the dog off the prong for this experience because if the dog is pulling or overly excited about my dogs, whether it's fleeing or fighting or just wanting to pull and get to the dog, maybe it's over hypersocial, I don't want the prong to send any other messages there. So I put the dog on a wide martingale so that it could pull just like that. Finally. <clears throat> So sniff social, excited. Hi. You so excited? Play bow, play bark. Yeah, she's social. Come on, let's go. So she... Play bow, play bark. I don't know what's going on with the glitch. It was a bad, bad reception that day. Advocating that stimulation is the question. Because she's so dynamic, I am going to put her on a wide martingale for the next couple dogs. Okay. So even that uh, Martin Gilly brought her in was too blunt and too thin. So uh, again, I don't want her self-correcting as she's hopping around and she's happy. I want to use that momentum. I want to use that enthusiasm, keep it and forge, you know, good interactions with dogs, good experience with dogs and use it to potentially install a greeting ritual to say, hey, keep all your enthusiasm. Love that you love dogs. Here's how you get to them. Greeting ritual, walk alongside me. And I'll auto sit and I'll release you to say hi, dog. Uh, say hi to the dog. 
which is also something else the industry does not do at all. Every other trainer that I know is totally against this type of stuff. So check this out. Gigi is the canary in the coal mine. For a conflict-seeking dog that might read Boo's body language as social and they lower the battle shield, when Gigi comes out because Gigi stares at them and doesn't move in that statue little posture she's in, it's off-putting. For a conflict-seeking dog, it could be provocation. Uh, for a dog that reads body language and is savvy to body language, they will not come in as hot and as social. For a hyper-social dog, they won't read it or give a shit because they haven't been socialized and they will run towards Gigi, be too much, look to mount. And so it's a great way to test what do you do with a neutral dog that doesn't really want to play. And this dog is hypersensitive to it, taking space. See that? And really doesn't want to encroach, reads it appropriately, and backs off. Social cues. So she does know a body language. Boo showed friendly. She moved in quick, got excited quick. Gigi's not showing friendly. So she's maintaining the space. So she's not even hyper social. Love it. Love this dog. Yeah. If I didn't have a Val, I would have fucking said, this dog is too much for you. I, you should totally. I'm going to, I'll take the dog off your hands. She, she's super vicious. All right. Moment of truth. We already know where the pressure point is going to be. This dog's got murder on their mind. They jumped off of a fucking house to go for a squirrel. Moment of truth. What happens when Juju comes out? Nice weird. If she starts to mirror that movement, then it could be a little bit of a prey mechanism. Yeah. Now I let this go because I want to see if it is prey. I need more observations of the dog mimicking Juju's path. For a dog that is pursuit driven and they are chasing a dog down, they'll mirror Juju's movement. And then you might see that soften up and then go to sniff social, or you might see that perpetuate and it gets more and then they go in to try to bite. Behavior observations, it's not about snapshot what do you see this is what the dog is this is who they are it's about as the dog has some duration in their exposure and you do not communicate and you do not get involved at all and you allow that dog to experience the helper dog or the trigger dog what happens through this period of exposure right and so when the dog makes subtle changes and starts to emerge as i just want to sniff you i was super overstimulated when you were running and ramping that was crazy to me and now that i'm closer and i've clocked your movement a little bit i don't want to eat you the way i want to eat squirrels i know you're a dog and then i want to get in there and i want to smell you and identify your pheromones that tells you so much about the dog right and you can say that the dog isn't going to have predatory drift with tiny terriers based on that observation more readily than, oh, overstimulated, pull the dog out, not ready, whatever you might do in tempering your observations. Not prey, trying to smell her, trying to get to know, trying to identify her pheromones, does not see the dog as a prey item, but stimulated by that sound, high pitch. It's just excited. Yeah, she's fucking perfect. Let's go ahead and one more time, we'll bring my my teenager is supposed to clean the poop in the yard and he never does a good job I'm, at this point i'm cussing because i'm cleaning up poop that almost stepped in anyway sidebar all right waffles let's pull it back friendly excited Years back. What's up? This guy's weird. I don't care. I, I think I was actually trying to get in close because I. this is the type of dog that Waffles lowers his battle shield for once he realizes it's a girl. I was actually trying to see if I could do that in session. Um, so, plus plus. Yeah, yeah, no worries. If you Google Denise Finn. 
Uh, so their homework is to go to the highdrivedog.com, start learning the stuff that you need to train. Like I like Denise's stuff because it's very slow and methodical and oftentimes you're not going to worry about arousal issues. It's not like STS canine crank on the dog and dynamic stuff. It's very slow and antiquated. Even like entrance to heel is static hand drop and like teaching the dog to respond like power steering to your fingers. Like everything Denise does is just like mad scientist slow. And for a first time Malinois owner, you want slow because the thing that's going to work against you is arousal or problems that you could inconsequentially or accidentally create in your session would come down to moving too quickly and possession issues and arousal issues. And so Denise's stuff is perfect for that. And then when they come back to me, I will work on the higher pay, the faster pace stuff, like the predatory drift and the capping and get the dog better at listening when they're aroused, et cetera, so that it's done in a controlled setting under the guise of a professional. So if there's a weird thing, we can pivot, right? And we'll work through the predatory drift, right? Pretty my my backyard is a blessing for working predatory drift because the squirrels in my backyard fucking they love antagonizing dogs so that that is it interesting session cutie pie for sure i i don't know how i became a malinois guy i that were i think if you if my name is mentioned in the bay area some for some reason it's mentioned around like shelter mouths and shelter like dutchies and german shepherds i don't know why but i'm really happy because i love the breed i'm it's just i love training but i love breeds and then when i get to train my favorite breeds it's just it's everything to me i honestly if i could pay my mortgage i'd do it for free pretty cool session pretty useful for malinois owners maybe i'll even drop this webinar on youtube as well to help out some people i did get my first virtual after that prong session where i was the first time i was zoe i think this is the dog's name that i was conditioning the prong i my virtual the next day a client said i've breathed a sigh of relief because i just thought i i was so shamed at the idea of using a prong but then when i saw you conditioning a prong i felt so much better i'm like man what the fuck man what kind of message am i sending i'm not sending this message but people are getting this message and so we'll, we'll drop this webinar on youtube and people can have at it and we'll see what they we'll see what they say